Hi, this is Alyssa Brantley from Everyday Maven, and you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk Podcast. Hey, food bloggers, are you ready to accomplish your 2023 goals faster than you ever thought possible? If you are nodding your head yes right now, the Eat Blog Talk Mastermind program might be a great fit for you. We are now accepting applications for 2023, and I will let you in on a little secret. If you sign up before the end of November 2022, you can lock in at the current pricing. Go to eblogtalk.com forward slash mastermind for more information and to apply. Here is a current mastermind member, Carrie from talkingmeals.com, telling you why you should consider joining the mastermind in 2023. You know, I just would tell people to take the leap because the motivation and the support that I've gotten from the women in the group has been invaluable and has just re-energized me. But run the numbers, you know, because I think if anybody actually took the time to just take the price tag out of their head, but put it on paper and look at, you know, when they could get a return on that investment, they would see that it's not such a crazy number, at least if that was their holdback. And if their holdback was just, you know, the fear factor of it, then again, it's that if you don't put yourself out there, you're never going to grow. You have to get uncomfortable. If we stay comfortable, then we're never going to change. Hello, food bloggers. Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, the podcast for food bloggers looking for the value and confidence that will move the needle forward in their businesses. This episode is sponsored by Rank IQ. I am your host, Megan Porta, and you are listening to episode number 350. I have Alyssa Brantley with me today. I'm so excited to chat with her. This is her second time on Eat Blog Talk. She was one of the first interviews I ever had on this podcast. But today we're going to talk about the process of writing a cookbook and how it can re-energize your creativity for blogging. Alyssa's cooking philosophy is whole food half the time. Just because you're busy, it doesn't mean you shouldn't eat great. The creator of the popular food blog, everydaymaven.com, Alyssa focuses on seasonal whole food recipes that are packed with flavor, but made in minutes with easy shortcuts. Her work has been featured in Real Simple, Today, Self Magazine, HuffPost, Gourmet Magazine, Prevention, and many more. Alyssa lives with her family in Seattle. Alyssa, hi. How are you today? So happy to have you here. So happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. This was the 350th episode. I couldn't believe it because I remember the beginning. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we've come. You. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> we've come a long way. And it's funny because my son, who's in the room with me right now, he just like remembers names and he always asks me, like, who are you interviewing today? And I said, Alyssa. And he was like, oh, Alyssa Brantley. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you remember her name. And he's like, well, of course I do. So he I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So funny. Okay. Well, we want to know before we get into talking about cookbooks, if you have a second fun fact to share with us. I do have a fun fact. This is a very big week. So I just wrote this cookbook. It's called the I Don't Want to Cookbook, which we'll talk about in a minute. And my fun fact is that a recipe from the book and my face and like a quote is actually going to be in this week's People magazine. Oh my gosh, that is the coolest ever. I'm so happy for you. I, Thank you. I mean, that is... That's huge. People Magazine is huge. And I'm totally going to buy a copy. I don't usually, but (laughs) which issue is it? Do you have like details? It is the August 15th issue, but they go to, they go to press a week earlier. So I know that I know it's on stands in some places because my mom found a copy and bought them all. Right. But I went yesterday to a local store and they didn't have it yet. And they said it comes in today. So I'm going to go back. Okay, I'm going to go look later this week too. So, congratulations. Thank you so much. So excited for you. I know, it's very exciting. And congratulations also about your book. And I want to hear how this book came to be. Like, how did you concept it? And can you just talk through kind of the journey of how it was created? Yeah, definitely. So, this book really happened as a result of the pandemic. During the pandemic, during the lockdown, I live in Seattle, which was like kind of a hardcore lockdown place. And we, you know, in the beginning, like most people, we didn't really know what we were dealing with and everybody, you know, started like cooking and restaurants were closed and no takeout and and no convenience foods of any kind. And it was like, I think within the first month I was like, whoa, I think like the MVP of this is our dishwasher, you know, (laughs) because we were running it like twice a day. And I was like, didn't we used to run the dishwasher like every other day? 
And it just, it never seemed like it ever stopped cooking and, and every single person working from home, schooling from home, right? And I know that I'm sure you had the same experience. Yes. And it was just so monotonous and it was such a burnout. And then the, the thing started where like certain things became out of stock. You remember that? Where yes. every, you know, couple of weeks it was like you couldn't get beans or you couldn't get toilet paper or whatever it was where you lived. I felt so burnt out when we started to kind of come like out of that. And I would talk to friends and blog readers and social followers and everybody seemed to feel this like intense just drudge and burnout. And I was thinking like, I feel like this and I literally enjoy cooking. <laughs> and all of these other people feel like this. Like there has to be a way to reinvigorate like what it means to prepare meals for ourselves and for the people we care about that isn't so taxing. And that's where the idea came from. And while I personally do actually love to cook, I don't always feel like cooking. And you know, who does? Sometimes you just don't want to deal with it, but you really kind of have to, whether it's that you know, you can't get takeout because it's expensive or because it's not convenient or you don't want the quality of the ingredients or whatever it is, right? So yeah. it came from that place. And so it's the I don't want to cook book. So it's like, let's keep simplifying down to make this as easy as possible, but still really delicious. I love simplifying. I feel we talked a little bit about this before pressing record. I just am such a minimalist with my recipes. I don't think people like huge ingredient lists. I mean, sometimes it's nice, right? Like if you're doing an extravagant dinner, but that's the exception yes. for me. Like Same. I love minimalists. Like I remove things from my ingredient list all the time if they're not necessary because That's right, yeah. simpler is better in my opinion. Absolutely. And I mean, there's a time and a place for those complicated recipes. And yeah. I'm all about that like once a quarter project, right? Where you make like the cake that has 27 steps to it. But like that is not my daily life. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah, right. This is not real life. <laughs> Do not aspire for it to be with kids and work and responsibilities and sports. And I, and like, we want to eat good food. And, you know, the book is based all around whole food ingredients, which is also how I cook on my website. There's been, I think, a long disconnect between fast and real food. Like you don't have to use like sauce packets and seasonings and all of this kind of like other stuff that that's processed in order to make quick meals. And so I wanted to dispel that a bit with these recipes. Mm, I love it. So you came up with the concept. So tell us how it went after that. Yes. So, you know, because I've been in the industry for a long time, um, I do have a, a fair amount of connections from whether it's conferences or retreats or just, you know, being in the industry for 10 years. And so I had some conversations with a few friends of mine who wrote a bunch of different cookbooks and have had a lot of success and talked about it. And then I talked to one of their publishers and it wasn't really the right fit. And then it was like a circle of conversations just happening around me. And I was actually approached by Simon & Schuster to have what? a conversation. Okay. I didn't know it was Simon & Schuster. Wow. Yes. So Adams Media is an imprint of Simon & Schuster that does a lot of their titles in this category. And so Simon & Schuster is the distribution and the parent company. And so Anyway, so the point is, so we wound up having this conversation and we went back and forth about this concept and how like timely it was and what people were experiencing and how like my Whole Foods half the time concept so easily fits in with speaking about this topic. Yeah. So then it just like, did it go pretty fast from there once you guys no. decided? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't. I have to be honest and tell you, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it. When I started to really lay out everything it would entail, I was really hesitant. I thought, you know, this is going to be so much time and I don't know if I want to take it on when I really think about it. And after I started to think, okay, you know, what are the parts of this that I really don't want to do and what part is exciting to me? it became clear that as much as I'm capable and competent of doing my own photography, that doing the photography, the book felt like the biggest sort of like dark cloud. And I think one of the reasons is that I live in Seattle and I do natural light photography and it's really, really tricky to do that on a regular consistent basis through the fall and the winter here because the light is not predictable and um, it can get really heavy and really gray. And I knew that I wasn't going to, you know, be able to just switch to, you know, artificial light photography overnight. That's a process. Mm. And so 
when we finally got to the point where it was like, okay, I'm not going to do the photography. Then I felt like, okay, just getting creative with these recipes is starting to sound exciting to me. That's awesome. Yeah. So getting rid of the pieces that you aren't necessarily excited about is huge. That opened up doors for you. Yes. And like, I like writing and I like, you know, putting ideas onto paper. And so the writing part and the recipe development part started to become more and more attractive and like exciting. And uh, one of the concepts for this book from the publisher was having a graphic designer who would design the cover and then get really involved on the interior of the book to make it really fun, which I love. I think it turned out amazing. And it's a little different looking than a lot of the books out there. There's so many more graphics, which I really appreciate. So I started to just focus on the parts that were really energizing for me. That's awesome. I have a copy of your book and I love the graphics on the cover and throughout. It is such a unique but beautiful book. It's different than anything I've ever seen. And I'm guessing that's what you're referring to when you say that it's just like a little unique. Yeah. It has like a different feel to it, right? It's like it does. fun. And, yeah. And I and I really appreciate that because it feels like right for the moment. Yeah. And there's so many books out that look the same, mine included. Like they're published by the same people and they have the same size and the same paper. Yes. And yours, I opened it and I was like, oh, wow, this is so fun. It was just, I I don't have anything on my cookbook shelf like it, which so much. is great, right? Compliment. So, yeah. Because, like, I mean, there's so many amazing cookbooks in our space, you know, but I do feel like it does kind of hit a little different. And I, and I love that. It feels different. It feels fresh and it feels like, you know, something that I I really feel like, you know, is answering what we're going through, which is like, we need more fun right now. Oh my gosh. That's so true. It is like a reflection of what we need. And it's funny that it was also born from the pandemic. (laughs) Yes, totally. Cause I mean, the burnout was real. (laughs) Oh gosh. So I don't think there's a human in the world who didn't feel kitchen burnout on some level during that time. I thought it was funny. There was a point in time that I think it was like Kim Kardashian was stuck at her house with her kids and they all had COVID so they couldn't have like their normal staff because <laughs> yeah. you know, she has, probably has like a staff of who, who knows how many people yeah. around her at any time. And she did like a video of her making like Annie's mac and cheese. <laughs> and she was like losing her mind. She oh my God. I think she hilarious. doesn't even usually do that, right? She has like a chef, you know what I mean? But yeah. she was like, oh my God, this is so hard. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I remember being like, this is like every meal and snack for all of us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Like, welcome to our world. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. yeah, this is really hard. <laughs> We're yeah. doing this like around the clock. So you let go of the photography, which felt amazing. Is there anything else that you let go of in order to focus on the writing and the fun parts? You know, I really just, it was hard though for me to let go of the photography because I know that I could do it. And there was, as I was creating recipes, there were certain recipes where I'm like, I know exactly how I would style this, right? So it was a challenge, but I knew it was the right decision in order for me to continue with like a consistent workflow. I also really just let go of like trying to do it all. Because I think that it's easy to get into that like hustle mindset and then drive yourself to insanity of like never really doing anything good because you're doing everything. And I just focused on the content for the book and the writing and tried to really make it my main priority in terms of my workflow and share about it on social when it felt appropriate and just really like hone in on each recipe and get creative until I was satisfied with like the result. And so I, I took off some of that pressure, that valve that is usually there. and was like, you know what? It's fine. It's fine to not do these other things. Relinquishing a little bit of control actually feels really good <laughs> sometimes. It does. And I haven't even gone back to the old schedule that I had because I think it's not even necessary. It's not healthy. And like, I think that there's this, this desire to do too much since like our business has transformed into like a social and SEO business. Like everybody wants to wear every single hat and I can't wear every single hat. I just can't do it. (laughs) Yes. It's not, nor it's not normal. You can wear some of those hats, right? (laughs) Good for you. I love hearing that because there are so many pressures to do it all. And I feel like that is evolving like literally weekly. Like there's a new thing you're supposed to do and, oh, you're supposed to do this too. It just gets to be so dang much. So I love talking to bloggers who are like, nope drawing the line, making boundaries. I'm not going to do it all. 
And also, I think that also everybody starts to copy each other. You know, it's like everybody's yeah. doing the same exact thing in the same cadence. It's like an army of people copying each other. And that's why everything keeps changing so quickly, because as soon as that that happens, it becomes not as good of a strategy anymore. Oh, I totally agree with that. Let's take a really quick break to talk about a service I'm really excited to share with you. As a food blogger, you've got so much on your plate. You are busy developing recipes, taking photos, writing posts, managing social media, and all of the other things. You work hard to help your readers live a more delicious life. Even though you enjoy working in your business, I think we all do it because we love it, your to-do list is probably a mile long. You know what I'm talking about. And maybe there are certain things you'd rather not deal with, such as writing. If writing is not your cup of tea, you do not have to go it alone. Heather Eberly is a content writer for food brands. She uses copywriting and marketing techniques to grow your business so you can focus on doing the things you love. If you want to gain Google traction, stand out from the crowd, and take your income to the next level, Heather can help you. Go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash resources to get more information about Heather's services. Again, go to eatblogtalk.com forward slash resources and click on Heather's link. And now let's get back to the episode. I want to hear more about your streamlining of the recipe. So you talked earlier about how you love having minimalist kind of ingredient lists. Yeah. How did you implement that into your cookbook? What I did was I, I came up with a collection of recipes and then I went back and forth with the um, editorial team for the book, who was amazing to work with. And we settled on, and they really, I mean, honestly gave me such creative license over it. I just, I think I was self auditing and refining what I thought would be a good mix of recipes for the audience. And I just kept refining it until I felt like really good about the mix. And then once that recipe collection was settled on, I tested my recipes from my own recipes. Either, you know, I, there was a few that I used from my website and even made them more simple than they are there. <laughs> and then I backed into every single recipe by testing it in such a way that I would say, okay, if I make this recipe, what can I take away from an, the ingredient list or the instruction list, meaning take away some steps that would still leave me with a recipe that tastes as close to the original with a lot less effort and a lot less work. And then another thing I did was this concept of overlapping ingredients, which is one of the themes of the book. So that I use a lot of very similar ingredients across recipes intentionally so that you don't have to have those one-off ingredients where you're like, oh, I'm missing the one thing I need. It's like you probably already have those things because it's in the it's in the you know shopping list or you see that it's in so many different recipes like for instance bagged cleaned baby spinach like i consider that fast food like it's a convenience food because it cooks in 30 seconds mm -hmm. right and so that is one of my favorite fallback vegetables when i am really short on time or effort or you know motivation to get in the kitchen because I know that I can create something in literally less than 60 seconds with something like baby spinach. So I use it a lot in the book intentionally so that there's less prep work. There's you know less time at the stove. And so those overlapping ingredients by swapping and subbing those around, then you could make more recipes from the book. If you buy the ingredients for like, say, the bruschetta chicken, but you're like, oh, you know what? I don't actually feel like that. You probably can make another recipe from the book with the same ingredients. Oh, I love that. And you're taking pressure off for the readers. And this is already a book about, you know, streamlining dinner, but you're taking additional pressure off by going through and thinking about those ingredients, which is super cool. I don't know that many other cookbooks do the same. Yeah. I mean, I think it doesn't have to be as complicated, right? And you and I talk about that. Like we both agree <laughs> it needs to be easier, you know? And anybody who's familiar with your recipes knows that, you know, you care about making it simple, but delicious. And so yeah. this is a really relatable for you. And like, I feel like people want this and they really understand that like, you know what, sometimes things are more overcomplicated than they have to be. And so let's just take it back down. What are the basics you need to create this delicious chili or... You know, you can make a chicken noodle soup from scratch in less than 30 minutes. Recipes in the book. Like, it's actually easy. But if you don't feel like doing that, there's a 10-minute soup recipe in there. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. There's nothing worse for me than going to a recipe and seeing ingredients that I'm like, there's no way I'm ever going to buy that. Why is that here? (laughs) So my take on that is that, yes, I agree with you. My take on that is that if it's something like shredded mozzarella cheese, I know that you're probably going to use that in other places in your life. So I don't have a problem saying use two cups of shredded mozzarella cheese and you know you're going to buy like a Costco size bag or something. But if it's a specific ingredient, then what I tried to do or what I made sure that I did for the cookbook is use the entire amount that I would ask you to buy. So I wouldn't say like, hey, go buy a can of diced chilies, right? And then only use a a tablespoon of it. Like it's like use the entire amount. I don't even know that I use diced chilies in the book. I'm just giving that as an example. (laughs) But like if you had an ingredient that was like a one-off, it would be for the entire recipe. Yeah. So smart. So that you wouldn't wind up, right, with like extras that you're like, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah. (laughs) Or like half a can of something and then you put the can in the fridge and it sits there for six months and you're like, great, that's awesome. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So in chapter one, you have a bunch of tips for like back to school. Talk about those because that helps people even further. Yeah, totally. So I have a bunch of tips. Chapter one is dedicated to different tips and tricks and secrets that save you time and also help you shop more efficiently so you can save time prepping your food. And when I say prepping your food, I want to preface by saying I am not asking anybody to spend like an hour or a day doing food prep for this book. That is not on the table. That is, I think, very cumbersome and it it works for a certain period of your life. But I have like a busy life. And if you have, you know, work, or family, or responsibilities, or sports, or kids, or other people you have to take care of, spending a big chunk of time prepping is really hard. And so I'm not saying to do that. (laughs) I just want to be clear. (laughs) Yeah. What I am saying is that if you cook with things like carrots, or onions, or shredded cabbage, let me tell you and teach you the ways to save even more time with those ingredients. You may not have to sit and chop them. So I give options for that in chapter one of like how you could buy certain things fresh, buy certain things frozen, buy it already prepared. Like, And then if you wanted to do it yourself, here's how you could chop onions once a month and freeze them in specific portions. But you don't have to do any of that. Like, But there's options there for the ultimate ways to save time. Oh, you're just giving us all permission to like create delicious, healthy-ish recipes and not wasting our lives, which is, I think, what we all want, Alyssa. (laughs) I hope so. I hope my whole goal here is just to make it easier. And like the most satisfying comments come from people who are messaging me saying like, I just made the the most delicious meal from your cookbook. And it was legitimately so easy. Or like my 12 year old made it. Or, you know, my 15 year old picked up this book and I just got a copy for my child who just moved out. Like it's so satisfying because I feel like people are energized about making good food. For sure. So if somebody else who is listening is considering this as a project, what would you tell them? Do you have any nuggets of wisdom after having just gone through this? Yeah. So I really got energized and energized creatively by the process. I felt, I have felt over the years that as the business of recipe development and photography and food blogging has changed, I've really been disenchanted with like the sit in your chair and do spreadsheets aspect of it. I am a much more visual and creative person. And so I like to say that our business used to be 90-10, 90% creative, 10% mm. promotion. And it's now it's, it's 10-90, right? It's 10% creative, 90% spreadsheets, SEO, computer, and promotion yeah. and social. And I don't enjoy that, that dynamic. And so it's something I've really had to be honest with myself about. And the process of writing this book has really energized me creatively. I feel so inspired about the recipes and like the way that I was able to create this body of work that really genuinely helps solve a great like real problem that people have right the second. And also like sharing so many tips and tricks and writing the 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 text and the copy. And so I feel like I would say, you know, Really think about what it is that you want. Is it that you really want a place to be creative? Or do you really care about photography? Like what part of it is is the most important for you? And get in touch with that. There's a lot of different reasons to write a cookbook and not everybody has the same like agenda or goal. 
It's super refreshing to me to hear from you that this re-energized you and reinvigorated you and your love for creating food because so often I hear people just get burnt out through this process of creating a cookbook. It's more tedious and just kind of a pain, to be honest. Yeah. So this is great. This is really encouraging to hear this perspective. And I think like taking the photography off the table helped me because I didn't feel that pressure. You know, I wasn't like, oh my God, if I don't capture this chicken noodle soup at that exact 115 window of lightness on Tuesday, (laughs) I'm screwed in my timeline, right? Because (laughs) when you work on a project like that, you usually have a pretty aggressive, you know, timeline of, of workflow. And so for me, I mean, taking the photography away really helped me not feel that extra pressure and allowed me to stay creative. And so that was really helpful. And for some people, it might not be the photography, right? It might be part of the writing or something, some other aspect of it. That's right. And that's why it's so important to tune into like, what is this about for you? And, you know, what do you need right now? You know, for me, it feels... I love to be creative and I felt really drained from the pandemic, from the constant, you know, drudge of cooking. And then also not being able to really go to restaurants. Like that's a place where I used to get inspired, you know, whether it was, you know, my husband and I would go out on a date or take our kids to a new place and try a dish with new flavors. And you get, you get inspired and you get ideas about like techniques or flavor combinations. And so taking all of that off the table, it was like, whatever we could get delivered to our house from the grocery stores that we're delivering during this period of time. And I feel like this was a reawakening. And sometimes what got delivered isn't what you actually wanted. So you would like, like all the oh, time. Right. look what I got today. That's interesting. That was, yeah. It was weird. You're like, I didn't so ask weird. for 150 lemons. <laughs> I asked for one you know, pounds or whatever. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah it, was weird. it was it was an interesting time. I like that you brought up the restaurant thing too, because we don't always think of that, that restaurants are where we get a lot of our inspiration for food. And when that's removed from the equation, it really does affect us as food bloggers and creators. Travel. I mean, like traveling and restaurants are are so important for inspiration for me. You know, everybody's yes. different. For some people, it's reading a magazine. But I find that's really like inspiring. I love to taste other people's creations and even dinner parties, right? Like other people barbecue. Somebody has a technique of making barbecue chicken that you've never tried. You're like, what is that yeah. flavor that I'm smelling or tasting? And those are inspiring moments. And I, it really became clear with every single one of them wiped away. I was like, wow, this is like very much a blank canvas. (laughs) And even now, I don't know, everybody's different in terms of where they live. But one of the things that we've noticed here, we live in a major city and like Seattle's a pretty like good food city, you know? Yeah. But restaurants are having a really hard time coming back from this and staffing is an issue and like all of these things. And we've been noticing that some of our favorite takeout places are closing at like eight o'clock at night. Literally. And also some of them are like, oh, you didn't call in advance to schedule your order. We're booked. (laughs) We don't have enough staff. And we're like, yo, wasn't the whole point of takeout to like do it last minute? But I understand the the pain and, and like, you know, the suffering that the restaurants are going through. And so I don't begrudge them in any way. But even now it's not fully easy to go back to what it was. It's so true. Even Chipotle, oh my gosh, it's hit or miss. Sometimes yeah. they're like, there's a sign on our door down the street that says, sorry, we don't have over half of our ingredients, so we are closed. Like, that is crazy. I mean, I like you, like, I get it. We were taking the kids after like a tournament for sports, and they had a sign on the door that was like, we don't have avocados, chicken, yeah. cilantro, and tortillas, tacos. cheese. And I'm like, okay, why are you operating? We were like in the middle of nowhere, and we were so excited to find a Chipotle. So we were like, oh, okay, well, we're going to have to figure this one out. You know what I mean? What can we have? You can have beans. <laughs> no, they were like, we're going to close. Like, yeah. They were just oh my like, gosh. It's, yeah. It's, cra- it's really been interesting. It has been. It's been such a weird, crazy journey. So I can see where this book is going to save people and add flavor to their lives, but simplicity as well. Yes. So speaking about just the process, is there anything else you would leave food bloggers with as far as like anything involved, whether it's finding a topic or finding a publishing place or anything else? 
So I would say the topic should be something you're really excited about. You know, don't do a cookbook just to do it. Don't do, for me, I never wanted to do like the everyday Maven cookbook, right? I didn't, I just wasn't excited about that. Not that I don't love my website. I just want to do like something that is more of a niche, you know, like really specific. And so I would say, you know, take what you're really good at and go even further, niche down even further, unless you already are in that space. If you already are like a vegan barbecue chef, you're pretty good. You're in, you're in a good niche, yeah. right? <laughs> but if you have a more generalist site like I do, then I would say really hone in on one thing. And so like for me, one of my absolute favorite things to do is to create soup recipes. And I would love to do like a soup book, but apparently publishers are not super interested in that because it's so seasonal. And it's harder to sell, you know, and it's not like a dessert where you need a dessert for like every holiday or every, you know, people want a a date night or a weekend or a family gathering. Like it's just, there's more fluidity there with sweets. So like, look at what you're really interested in and then get real about, could this book sell? Is it mass market enough? Is there a big enough audience? Like those kinds of things really matter. Yeah, that's great advice. I feel like everything you're saying too relates to blogging. Like literally it's, it could be a conversation about blogging, but we're talking about cookbooks. So that just really stood out to me. Yeah. And like from a blogging standpoint, I've long held the belief that my website could probably serve by being niche down and I haven't done it because it doesn't really fit my recipe collection. But I think that niching down is very useful for marketing. Yeah, totally agree. Okay. So a big part of finding success with a cookbook because a cookbook is a labor of love. It takes a lot of energy, even if you enjoy it. It's a lot of time and a lot of energy. So you want to be rewarded a little bit by Amazon. So I would just encourage people to go rate and review Alyssa's book because that will be huge for her. So Alyssa, why don't you tell us all again the name of the cookbook and if they can go to other places besides Amazon, or would you rather have them rate and review on Amazon? So the book is called The I Don't Want to Cook Book. So it's a play on words by Alyssa Branley, right? And you can buy it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, really where everywhere books are sold, chapters in Canada, and then all of the independent bookstores. And Amazon reviews, when you have purchased the book or you've made the recipes and you have an authentic review are so helpful. If you do get the book and you wind up making a recipe and loving it, I would so appreciate a rating and review on Amazon. It really helps with the algorithm and also with um, getting really good press. So that is a great place to do. And you don't have to buy the book there to read it there. If you buy it at Target or Barnes & Noble or wherever, and you would rather read it on Amazon, that's fine. I just definitely want authentic ratings of people who really have experience with the book because it's so helpful to hear people's real experiences. Well, I'm going to do that this week and I'm also going to grab a copy of People Magazine. So here to support you. Yes. Is there anything else you want to mention before we start saying goodbye? No. If anybody wants to find me, you can find me on social. All my handles are at Everyday Maven. And always, if you have any questions about the book or anything else, you can always reach out to me. And that's really it. I'm really excited to get the book into more people's hands and hopefully like hear the stories about how it's saving them time and effort. Yes, I'm excited for you. Congratulations again, Alyssa. Thank you. Do you have a quote or words of inspiration to leave us with? I do have a quote. I have a little post-it up on my desk that I have had there for like three years. It's gray and dirty. (laughs) And it's got this quote on it that I saw a few years ago that I just stare at all the time. And it says, have no fear of perfection. You'll never reach it by um, Salvador Dali. It's like a reminder to stay in your lane and be authentic. Because like the more you put fake boxes over yourself of what has to be and what is perfection, I think the farther you get away from your authenticity. That is beautiful. And that relates to everything you create and the way you live as well. And it all kind of bleeds into each other. So that is perfect. It is perfect <laughs> to talk <laughs> about perfection. So that's I should redo it on a new post-it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> get rid of the... Get a pen, <laughs> a marker, fancy. I don't know. I kind of I kind of like like authentic old weathered notes are kind of nice too. You know that they have meaning. 
Well, thank you, Alyssa, so much for being here. Everybody go support Alyssa in any way that you feel led. And then we will put together a show notes page for you. If anyone wants to go peek at those, you can go to eblogtalk.com forward slash everyday maven. So thanks, Alyssa, again for being here. And thank you. Yes. So great to talk to you again. Yeah. And I just want to say really quick, if any food bloggers have a specific question I didn't answer about the process, feel free to shoot me a message. Super generous of you. Thank you so much for being here today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Eat Blog Talk. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd be so grateful if you posted it to your social media feed and stories. I will see you next time.